things. It's into the overnight period where we'll start to see that rain push more widely across the rest of the UK. Could be some heavier bursts on that across Scotland into parts of northern England as well. And then as we head into the early part of Monday, it will be clearing its way off the far southeast, potentially just lingering here for a little while throughout the morning and into the start of the afternoon. Behind that, though, many of us will see a barrage of showers push their way in on Monday, and some of those could be heavy at times with the risk of some hail and thunder. And generally, that sets us up for the scene of some unsettled weather throughout the rest of the week. We do have our eyes on this area of low pressure that could bring some slightly stronger winds, particularly in the south and west, as we head Tuesday night into Wednesday. So do just keep up to date with the forecast in regards to that. Otherwise, enjoy your evening. Bye-bye. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate okay, Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Hello there, welcome back. I'm Bethany LC in the GB newsroom. Two British Israeli sisters who were killed in the occupied West Bank have been named by Israel's Prime Minister. Rina and Maya Zakharan were shot dead in their car near an, Is an Israeli settlement yesterday. Their mother remains in a critical condition. Benjamin Netanyahu offered his condolences to the family on behalf of all the citizens of Israel. The UK Foreign Office is calling for a de-escalation in tensions between Israel and Palestine after several British citizens were caught up in a series of attacks. 31 Ukrainian children who were taken from occupied areas during the war have been returned and reunited with their families. Moscow denies abducting the children and says they were taken away for their own safety. 
Kiev estimates 19,500 Ukrainian children have been deported to Russia since the invasion began. Last month, the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for President Vladimir Putin on charges of war crimes. Those involved say they're relieved to be home. He kept calling me and texting me, Mum, please take me. I do not want to go to an orphanage. We are very happy. We came back home. We have seen our mum for the first time in half a year. It was very emotional. We are all crying, the kids and the mothers. All this stress. But now, thanks to God, everything is almost over. We are already in Ukraine and we will soon be back home. A 12-year-old boy accused of murdering a grandmother in Sheffield has been remanded in secure accommodation. 60-year-old Marcia Grant was hit by her own car outside her home in Greenhill on Wednesday. Her family released a statement describing her as a pillar of the community. The boy, who can't be identified due to his age, is due before Sheffield Youth Court again on Tuesday. Nicola Sturgeon has spoken out for the first time since her husband was arrested, saying she has not been questioned by police. Earlier this week, the former SNP chief executive, Peter Murrell, was arrested by police investigating the party's finances. He was released without charge. The former first minister described the experience as traumatic, but says she intends to get on with her life and her job. Much as there are things I might want to see, I'm not able to do so, uh, other than to say that, as has been the case, there will continue to be full cooperation. Uh, the last few days have been obviously difficult, quite traumatic at times, but I understand that is part of a process. You're up to date on GB News. Now it's time for Headliners. Hello and welcome to Headliners. I'm Josh Howie and joining me to go on a frolic through Sunday's newspapers are two comedy bad boys, Leo Curse. There he is. Oh, Scott Capuro, number two. Uh, maybe less so. How are you guys? Yeah, good, thanks. You, got, you were just showing us a very beautiful photo of your baby there before. Yeah. And you got your milk. Yeah, I'm all set. I never do, know what to say when someone shows me a photo of the baby. You just meant to compliment the baby, right? That's all. Yeah, I mean, you shouldn't vomit like you did. Right, yeah. I, I think that was a little bit rude. I shouldn't say he looks bloated, because that's probably normal with a baby. <laughs> yeah, right? and also it was a she. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you misgendered my baby. Well, it's been calling me saying it feels like it's been born in the wrong body. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, Prepare yourself. There we go. <laughs> that would be, of course, the great irony. <laughs> right, let's get a quick peekaboo at Sunday's front pages. The Mail on Sunday, Charles at odds with Church over his diverse coronation. The Sunday Telegraph, Tories at war, over packed with Labour in Scotland. Observer, hospitals in frantic bid to fill gaps left by doctors' strike. Sunday Express, King to rescue Rishi, and he'll boost the economy too, exclamation mark. Uh, Sunday Mirror, I'll fight guns and gangs for my live. Finally, the star, love split, ghost, hubbies, Stalking me. Wow, they are really running our stories there. Let's begin with the front of the <clears throat> Mail on Sunday, Leo. So Charles is at odds with the church over his diverse coronation. So Charles' plans for the coronation are to, to have it. He wants, you know, uh, transgender, non-binary, uh, queer people of colour skateboarding in and doing somersaults and stuff. So he, he wants to uh, a bit of a departure. Mm. Uh, you know, it's going to be like every advert in 2023, and uh, he wants uh, participation by non-Christians. Uh, so the, 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 the coronation is supposed to bar other religions. As, as the king of England, you're supposed to be the keeper of the faith. Charles wants to be the keeper of faiths, which is a completely different thing. That's a, that's a different job. You're supposed to be, you know, it's a, it's a specific role. You're appointed by God or whatever, and, and you're, the, you know, you're the sort of direct, when God fires his lightning down into England, it goes through uh, the, king, the king first. And then where does it go? And then it goes out to out the other his, people. The, uh, oh, probably the, Prince Camilla. Andrew. Yeah. Prince Andrew gets some Who's ever investing in the family, actually. Yeah, so he, he, wants, he wants Muslim, Hindu, Jewish, uh, and other faith leaders uh, mm. reading prayers out during the service, which is, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that tears up, you know, a thousand years of, of uh, heritage, what we've been doing. Yeah. What, what do you think? So, I mean, is, he's, they're saying it's because he w doesn't want to exclude other religions. Do you think it's exclusion by not having them partake in the actual service, even if they're there in the audience? Right, I think it's just about modern modernity, actually. I think he wants to seem current. Mm. As old as he is, I think he doesn't want to seem... And Islam's a very current religion. It's, and Judaism. It's, it's totally on the front current. page. <laughs> totally. Totally on the front page. And um, I think he wants to seem like 
he listens and represents. Mm -hmm. You know, I think also he doesn't want to seem detached and he doesn't want to seem overpaid. So he, <laughs> I, I think he wants to seem like, look, I'm busy, I'm taking care of everybody, right? <laughs> so look at all the people we invited. I've been on the phone all day long, I'm exhausted. I'm not even king yet. Isn't so. the weirdest thing though about this story is that they spoke to a bunch of religious leaders and they all just went, yeah, we're not bothered. We don't really want to participate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just he's, they're doing it because it seems like the right thing to do, even though there isn't actually a demand for it. He's obviously, the royal family have obviously focus grouped this and realised, you know, hey, we're going to look good. We're going to, young people are going to think better of us if we, if we make it a super diverse coronation. But something like this should be a bit of a stick in the mud. It's something that's a tradition that goes back so many centuries. Shouldn't just change as to the, the whims of whatever's trendy at the moment. It should just be what it is. Yeah, they should have some beheadings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But he's always been a bit, prog a bit progressive, Charles, on mm. some issues, like on his organic farming, which he's made millions. I think that he's always, <laughs> he's always a, felt like he marriage. read that too. <laughs> he needed to, he, I think he's always felt like he needed to look at, in the future and reach out and all that, and that this is his way. I think they're, to be honest, I think they're trying to distract from whether or not Harry's going to be there. I think that's part mm. of this too. They're trying to take, take that headline well, Right, away. for a second there, I'd almost forgotten it's the most sort of pending question in my yeah, consciousness. Yeah. yeah. Well, it worked. Well done, Daily See? Mail. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to the Observer, Scott. Well, apparently, there's a photo uh, there first of um, uh, Line Regis and Dorset with people on the beach yesterday, mm. which I find hard to believe. I, I'm trying to look closer to see if they're all clothed. Can you see all the pollution? Can you see all the poos? I see all the cans. <laughs> They're actually ex-cons who've just been released. But anyway, <laughs> um, hospitals uh, are in a frantic dash to fill gaps left by a doctor's strike. Apparently, bullying doctors to uh, ask them to please not kill patients is not de rigueur. These, these doctors are feeling as though they're being bullied because they are threatening a strike that's going to last four days. And um, they're being told if they do strike by the hospitals they work for that either they won't be paid or they'll be fired. Uh, quote, a huge amount of bullying is going on, end quote, from one of the um, senior consultants at a London trust. And some of these junior doctors make only 14 pounds an hour. Mm. They want to make more. They want to increase their salaries, some hopefully by more than 50% so they can keep up with the cost of living. And these strikes are um, threatening, obviously, ill patients, but also surgeries. Even the fitter patients who could become ill because of these strikes very concerning. Well, yeah. that's it. I mean, I was going to say, Leo, is it, there's evidence that this actually will be... I mean, even though we've had strikes recently mm. in the NHS, but this could be much worse, I believe, because a lot of the consultants are on holiday, whereas yeah. before they covered. Mm -hmm. So, and now it's a four-day strike. It's, find it's also a, a big weekend for golf. Mm. So it's going to be it's going to be difficult access, to get experience. Wrist, wrists. Mm. It's going to be difficult oh, to get experience. Shop. It's going to be difficult to get experienced <laughs> people in to, to cover these roles. Mm. But I mean, fourteen pounds an hour. People bandy that around as if it's as if that's all they ever get. It's mm. it's like you know being a being an intern doing doing some some work for like less money so that then you can make the the big bucks. And people are going to die. People are going to die as a result of this strike. Mm. Well, whether it happens in the moment or whether it has long term in terms of sick patients, they're also doing another thing, as you said, Scott, but they're sort of, they're kicking, they're, they're in a race to empty their wards, mm. which makes me think, why aren't you doing that in the first place? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Why, well, maybe, maybe this will inspire them to work a little harder. Oh, but I think that the, it's not just, this will uh, probably end uh, some patients' lives, but also the un, underfunding of the NHS mm. is ending patients' lives, not just low pay that junior doctors are receiving, but you know, clinics closing, hospitals having to cut back on staff in general. I mean, the reason they can't find staff is because they've had to cut back so much in the last seven years. So they've reduced their own staff. And then the Brexit thing with fewer people coming Doctors in from other around. countries to work in the hospitals. Yeah, and there, all, there's also... Storm, really. Yeah, and it's pretty scary. I'm just glad I'm going to Spain next week. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, no strike there. <laughs> no. Uh, Labour row deepens over Sunak attack ad. This we talked about yesterday. Mm. Uh, this is also on the front page. So that seems to be sort of ongoing. Uh, they're saying, what, that Labour, that, that Keir Starmer didn't know about the ad or something? Yeah, apparently... Um, <laughs> well, Yvette, Yvette, Yvette Cooper was not told about uh, Labour's Sunak attack mm. at advance. So she's... Um, because she was informed, she's uh, about to release a widely criticised Labour advertisement that claims Rishi Sunak does not believe adults convicted of sexual, sexually assaulting children should go to prison, which is not really uh, the case, but that's how they're playing it. Mm. And she's, I think a lot of people are worried that this will just backfire yeah. on Labour because it's inaccurate.
at a very serious subject. Yeah, and of all the things that Labour could, could choose to have a go at another political yeah, party, yeah. I mean, safeguarding children is the last thing I'd well, be that's, picking. That's, that's not more, a battle that's, that Keir Starmer wants to get into. Well, that's Labour councillors. I mean, arguably, he went in. I know you, we talked about this last night, but yeah. he did go in after the fact to sort it out and to get these prosecutions happening so, up in those so places. When did, it, when did it go in? Two, 2004? Was it, well, when, when did it become head of the When CPS? it became apparent I mean, to him, he's we, running the actual We've service. had a problem with grooming gangs from, from basically the 90s all the way through to the, to the yeah, present Yeah, but he wasn't day. in that role at the time. When Man, he did he's, he's had some okay. influence in the Labour when Party he went during the, that time. He's no. had some influence in the okay, CPS no, the point during is, that time. The point is that when he did go in and when he was the boss, he made a change. And that is the important thing here. Uh, but the interesting thing is also they're sort of saying that it has racist undertones. And I haven't really picked up on that from the ad. Yeah. They're saying that the ad, having Rishi connecting him as an Asian man. Oh, to, and I yeah. never sort of picked up on that. Yeah, is that yeah, just yeah. the Observer, The Guardian, just being super... And the, and the, the statistics, the, own home, home, the home office's own statistics state that the majority of men who are grooming children in this country are white men. And yet... They decided to but choose... But it's, it's an 86% white finish. country. Yeah, I know, but well, that's, I'm sure, the point that, that is was correct. about to make. Yeah. Right. yeah, that's the point. And oh, so right. uh, I think choosing this, this ad with, with his image all over it, I just think it's... Not that it's unfair play, because that's politics mm. in general anyway. I just think it's a, it, it's, it's a conversation that's going to distract from the actual problem, mm. especially when Labour could be focusing on other issues, including the economy, and... Uh, that's what's more important, I think, to people at this point. Yeah, but I mean, I think that those issues are important and should be focused on. I just think it seems to be the way that they did it. Anyway, let's go to the Sunday Telegraph. Couple of stories, Leo. So here we've got the, the Tories at war over, uh, over the, the Scottish Tory leader. So Douglas Ross, who's the, the leader of the Tories in Scotland, mm. uh, says that Scots should vote Labour to oust the SNP, uh, which sounds, I mean, it sounds insane for, uh, for a, a Tory to be saying, hey, hey, why don't you vote Labour? I mean, that's, that's not, the, not the best that's thing. That's how to bad the SNP are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is how clueless. This is why the SNP managed to be number one in Scotland all those years. It's because uh, the Tories were telling people to vote for, for other, <laughs> other parties. Scottish people are English people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is uh, basically what it is, is they're, they're trying tactical voting. So where the Tories have got more of a chance of winning, uh, they're saying, uh, La Labour are saying vote Tory, and where, uh, where Labour have got more of a chance of winning, Douglas Ross is saying vote Labour. The thing is, Labour in Scotland aren't really any better than the SNP. They're still, they're, uh, you know, way ahead with all the gender woo-woo stuff. Uh, they want independence. So, you know, this Douglas Ross really is the leader of the only opposition in Scotland. So really, he should be saying, but also, just, just vote, for, vote for me. But also, Scott, the thing is that Labour set, is then set to get much more seats than the, SN, uh, than, than the Tories, right? In yeah, well, hopefully. I mean, you know, uh, Democrats and Republicans try this strategy in the US. Mm. Uh, Democrats go to states uh, where they think they have, uh, where they're trying to increase the majority and they, they try this sort of opposing strategy. Mm. The thing is, it confuses the hell out of voters. Because then suddenly they're like, I, I, I'm not sure who I'm supposed to vote for. And they, and they look for alternatives. Or, or this is what also encourages people to run for office themselves in the U.S. And then you get the guy with the dog from next door running and winning. It's a real problem. It, it, I think people, when, when they're told something contradictory in their own heads about what they should be doing by their own party, I think they, in America they start to see conspiracy. It's really interesting. And things start they to get sure bit... Sure do. Yeah, That's they what do. happens here they as well. And uh, yeah, so they choose the lady who lives in a tree because they trust her more because she lives down the street. To know? be fair, she has some good policies. She does. Uh, this is another story here in The Telegraph. Trust condemns global cartel of complacency for fixing tax rates. I can't believe anybody's actually <laughs> listening to <laughs> Trust and yeah, yeah. economics. Well, I mean, she is, she is the one Tory who wants to bring tax down instead of uh, increasing tax. Mm. So she's, she's saying, uh, at the moment, the, the OECD countries, uh, developed nation, nations are trying to institute a 15% corporation tax baseline. So no country will be able to undercut that. I know Ireland boosted its economy by, by undercutting corporation tax, mm -hmm. encouraging corporations to, to move there. But then it's unfair. It's a sort of race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, trust, she's got, the, she's got the right instincts, but this is the wrong thing to go after. Uh, I, mean, I, I don't know. I just think we pay way too much tax anyway. I think we should maybe just create a, a sort of international institution like the Thunderbirds that goes around and just batters people who put taxes up. Yeah, you've just solved the world's yeah. uh, economy situation there. Have you any thoughts on this, Scott? Uh, no, I thought... It's, trust... just, you were, it's just you had the, your glasses in your hand and you were looking... So, do, the, do the pose again. Mm. And you just looked intellectual there. You're like... I, I thought Trust was in a room turning a light switch on and off and she's about to put a bullet through her own eyes. I, I, I didn't know that she was still talking about politics.
She is at the World Super Economy. Cruise, yeah. no, well, uh, good for her. And people are paying her for it, it seems like, <laughs> as well. It's crazy. Right, that's it for part one. Join us after uh, we catch our breath back for why. If you want to be a criminal, you should move down south. And it seems the bodyguard needs a bodyguard. See you in two. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Co. Right, you're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit up. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are, those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yeah, that's right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers <laughs> tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We've got a brand new lineup every Saturday night on GB News. From 6 p.m., I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8 p.m. as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Brand new Saturday nights on GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Headliners. I'm Josh Howey, and this hunk of hunk is Leo Kurse. And over there is the Dorian Gray of the comedy circuit, Scott Capurro. He's 94 years old. <laughs> Kicking off this section with Mail on Sunday. And we have an incredible story, Leo, of schools being told to deal in scientific fact. Yeah, I can't believe this. They're rolling back some of the sort of gender woo-woo uh, that they've mm. been propagating in, in schools. So schools are now going to record whether pupils are boys or girls rather than asking them what their gender identity is. So the, the gender, the, the sex that they, they record is going to match the biological sex on their birth certificate. Mm. Because there's a, a fashion at the moment uh, for kids and like parents, friends that I know who've got ki teenage kids, say that like half the class is identifying as non-binary or trans or, or whatever, uh, which it seems unlikely that just in, you know, in the space of a few years, everybody would have suddenly become you know, transgender or non-binary or, or whatever it is. It's, yeah, it's a social contagion. It's like, uh, you know, it's like lichen bros or, or double denim or mullets or whatever. You know, it's just this one might be harder to, to grow out if you go the full, the full hog with it. Uh, but yeah, so, so now schools are, are being told to, to stick with biological fact rather than, you know... I, I think the policy like. change in schools is what encouraged kids to do this too because the teachers are expected to tell the parents immediately 
when their students identify themselves as a gender different from the gender they're born in. So I think the kids are seeing their friends doing and thinking, hey, wait, I want that too. I want to be cool like them. Mm. And then I want, I want to make my parents worried or angry or nervous, or I want the conversation at the dinner table not to be about me. You know what I mean? I think they're trying to establish well, themselves. I'd argue it's the opposite family. of that because schools have been hiding the fact. So I think it's more like that they're going, we want to keep a secret from our parents. Well, they're saying, they're saying about 28% of the schools are not reporting it. That's why they're coming forward and saying, if you're going to do it, you have to do it. But on the, on the forms, what we want is the fact. Mm. But in class, if this kid identifies, you have to call the parents. So I think the policy is set to protect both the schools and the students. Almost and the, like they're being adults. <laughs> and, and the schools are saying, w w w they've been begging the government some, for mm. some sort of clear standards at some point, because the schools are skating on real thin ice with this, trying to deal with some sort of social issue that they're not quote unquote educated to cope with. And mm. so they're in the middle of this. It sounds to me actually as though it's a struggle between families and kids and the schools get kind of caught in the middle. You know what I mean? Which is not where they should be. Like, well, they feel invisible their homes for whatever reason. They think this will make them more important. Mm. Mm. But I mean, Leah, does, does this remind you of the whole census scandal where they were just going to record like whatever you felt like your <laughs> gender was like that's they were yeah. this is the problem with conflating gender yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. sex and which is why now the EHRC is going to step in to go right this is what sex means yeah. Well, yeah, biology I've, I've noticed on so many you know government forms that I fill out, fill out when I'm uh, applying for, for grants as a, as a transgender skateboard or whatever mm -hmm. it is that uh, you know you can get money for this week uh, they ask for your biological sex now. So many NHS forms, it's your, your biological sex. It's not, you know, are you six spirit, you know, Navajo Indian identifying, whatever. Mm. And I mean, the thing that really should bring it home to people as to how this could be problematic is, can you imagine people identifying as a different race? You know, me p putting down that, yeah, actually I'm a, I'm a Nigerian woman. You know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a nonsense. But how is that any different from me identifying as, as something different to my biological That's sex? It, when it's feelings or whatever. But the funny, I saw something in America, like some pull down menu that just went on and on oh, and yeah. on, yeah. like crazy stuff. And you just think uh, the good thing here is now you're just going to go like, oh, male feel, oh, great, there we go. <laughs> I know I've been to my doctors in the US and it's like, are you a he, she, them, they, if that, and by the time you're done, you, you don't know who you are. Mm. You've kind of forgotten by the time you get to the end of the list. And I think in a way I like that, you know, as, as a diverse person uh, in the past, although gay white men now are as, as, as boring as a log <laughs> of wood, but in the old days when we had a wild card, I appreciate trying to represent people on a form. It makes, in a way, the doctor's job a bit easier because by the time you wind up in the seat facing them, they know a little bit more about you. But when it comes to medical stuff, sure. I mean, the, the, actually, the reason why I'm sitting here is because a couple of years ago, I was filling out a thing for my six-year-old daughter's get her jabs, um, and um, she, not not the, the COVID jabs, uh, but, and uh, the form just was like non-binary. It was all this stuff mm. for like a six-year-old girl. Yeah, and I was just, yeah. and I remember, and then I, and I messaged Andrew, I knew a little bit. I said, have you seen, this is madness. Mm. And he was like, oh, I'm doing headliners. You want to come on? And I was like, you know what? <laughs> I wish they had a box for, do you feel like a six-year-old girl? Cause I'd like to take that one off sometime. <laughs> yeah. And then just go in a room and have a cry by myself. That's what I want to do. Oh, but, so it doesn't make you a six-year-old girl. It just makes you a modern man. All right. <laughs> Sticking with the mail and schools. And it seems like a far-left crank has somehow managed to infiltrate a union, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> well, finally, we've got a far-left person heading a union. Who oh, knew, right? Yeah. He's a self-professed social justice warrior, by the way. Mm. He's won an award for that. And um, <laughs> seriously, his name is uh, Daniel Kabid, and he's been elected as the um, NEU general secretary. Mm. And he's professed a few political beliefs that are making people a bit anxious. One is that um, the war in the Ukraine is kind of the UK's fault. Another is that um, he attended a, a certain sort of festival where the audience was singing um, songs about well, there are negative feelings about Jewish people. So yes. We're now wondering if... for globalise the intifada. Yes. This last year. And that is a, a call to send, arguably, to murder Jews around the world. Yes, it is. Which we're seeing in Israel. And so that's what the intifada is. It's, it's innocent people, children, as we've just seen, yes. like yesterday, being murdered. Not, not soldiers, not uh, civilians. And when they say globalise the intifada, that's what they're calling for. Mm. So that is arguably disgusting. Also, he's a big supporter of Corbyn, yeah. which yeah. I would argue makes anyone at this point who's still a supporter of him being racist. Yeah. It's well, um, the, the, and, the, and these things are things that he's not shying away from. He'd like a peaceful dialogue in the Ukraine, he says. And he thinks <laughs> that the UK is bullying both sides to 
have a war. I mean, so. it's, it's nonsensical to, to support. I mean, he's, he, or he's not come out and openly supported Putin, but by criticising the West and criticising NATO, he's implicitly uh, he's implicitly backing Putin and giving ammunition uh, to Putin. When when Putin sees, when when the Kremlin sees uh, people in the West, leftist uh, politicians, and uh, you know some some right wing politicians um, uh, cr criticising NATO and, and weakening Ukraine, it gives it gives them hope and it makes them think, oh, if we just if we just hang on, if we kill some more Ukrainians, but, then we can we can eventually wear yeah, them well, down. And, and it's a bit more complicated though because you're not going to find a lot of Ukrainians in the Ukraine in support. If, necessarily with a warm place in their heart for the EU, the UK, or NATO. No, I, I think, think you will. No, you I, I don't will. think you will. No, I, I, think, I can I think, No, I, I can tell you, you that you are wrong about that, that people I, that live in the Ukraine, that my friends who live in the Ukraine, have a very strained relationship with the EU because they've turned their back on the Ukraine. And actually, the UK and the Ukraine, and the EU encourages the Ukraine to, dis, to dismantle their... Um, Nuclear, nuclear weapons, yeah. Policy. No, was, so the the no. problem the problem in the Ukraine is they feel like they don't have support very much from anyone right now, and so I think he's I think he's trying to sound like he's got boots on the ground in the Ukraine, like he knows more than the UK does. I think he's trying to sound like he's like I said a social justice war, and he knows what's going on, and we don't. Can no, we just get back to the story? So, oh, no, yeah. this is interesting, but I just want to get back to the story here. Does it matter? Because the other things he's saying, it says he wants to deal with underfunding in schools, Ofsted yeah. uh, reform, teacher workload. These sound like good things. Yes, but do, do, do his political positions make a difference to? his role now. Well, I think it'll completely undermine his, his credibility. I mean, see, we, and we've seen this in a, in a lot of unions and a lot of, uh, like the, the Students' Union, for example, another anti-Semitic leader who had to step down as, as a result of it. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's going to damage well, he's, he's been elected in that position, though, because they knew these things about him. He's been quite active for the last five years. Well, they said, but only 9% of the members actually voted exactly, in it. Yeah. But there are things here where he did talk, like British children are being taught a narrative of white saviours. He didn't. He said it was difficult to put, uh, celebrating Churchill during the 70, uh, 75th anniversary of yeah. VE Day, that he wants to take back control of the education system from a brutally racist state that sends refugees to Rwanda. That is not someone who I want sort of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say he's directly teaching our kids, yeah. but to have an impact yeah. on the teachers. He has who been are. teaching. He, he, he has, he's, he's a quite um, skilled educator of kids of all ages, though. So we wonder now what's been going on in classrooms, to, to be honest with you. OK, well, next up is The Observer. And Leo, is this finally some evidence that Brexit has an upside? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So French and German tourists are turning their back on Britain over Brexit. Apparently, it's because of post-Brexit restrictions on travelling with identity cards. Before, you could just uh, you could just swan in and out as, as you wanted, as we could do with, with Europe as well. And mm. uh, we're seeing them. I and this is, this is quite dramatic reduction. So walking tours in Oxfordshire uh, are seeing bookings from France and Germany at half their 2019 levels. I don't know if those bookings uh, are, are being made up and, uh, you know, more bookings from, from China or whoever we've got new trade <laughs> yeah. agreements. A lot of Americans are back. Right. So. Yeah. They, they don't like walking, though. So. It's not just that. It's also ferries uh, yeah, from ferries. Brittany. That's about half as well. Yeah, it's, it's over, over oh, half. I mean, yeah. this is this is pretty crazy. I don't know. I mean, COVID could still have a, a lingering impact on stuff like this. But I don't know. I think I think these rules uh, will gradually be relaxed over time and will become a more... Well, I think the sort problem unified... is, Scott, that what they're saying is that actually it's not just because of these rules. It might be because they now view us unfavourably. Yeah. That's what we see that, but... now from 7th to 14th. I was yeah. surprised how few Germans in French people actually have passports. I was really amazed. Mm. And that's why they don't want to make the, the journey, because they, they can't be bothered. I guess it's like being American. You can go anywhere within Europe. Yeah, also, yeah, I think yeah. people are waking up to the fact that Britain isn't a great place to go on holiday. Well, Americans are coming over here, which is great. Yeah. And hopefully they'll eat the amount that the, the Germans and the Germans <laughs> would eat. Or they'll eat the Germans that are here, maybe. <laughs> that's fine. Right, Sunday <laughs> Times now. And Scott, this story actually makes me want to go to the theatre. Um, well, the, a rowdy audience brought down the curtain on the Bodyguard musical. Uh, at the Palace Theatre in Manchester. I watched the video, it was hilarious. It was actually really two people, a woman yeah. and some other guy. And during, uh, when they, when, at near the end of the show, when, she's, when the lead actress is singing, uh, I Will Always Love You, you know, the Whitney Houston song, this woman okay. stood up in the balcony, started Wait, yelling. I think we've got a clip, actually. Oh, right. That's how, no, it's not me. All right. <laughs> uh, she, she looked a bit like you, I recognize Rob. this it's woman. Coming. Oh, hello, here she we go. She had broader shoulders. Oh, yeah, I yeah, know yeah. her. And they called the riot police yeah. on her, and she they moved the her. She was in the frog and bucket. 
Well, they moved her pretty quickly, and they Whoa. almost pushed her over the balcony. See, Whoa. her back is to the balcony there, so, and people are yelling. Sturgeon? <laughs> it looks a bit like her. Oh, can you imagine? She went over. It's actually great, two women, and that would be my <laughs> point. Is it, 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 I don't know about you guys. You, you're 20, 30 years in stand up. For right. me, it's always drunk women. Are the well, point. they can be difficult, yeah. and the, the security. Wine. I'm surprised the security handling her so mm. so hard because you know when you're playing the comedy store, the one that used to remain in, in Manchester, they couldn't touch the women. You can't touch women. Mm. You, you can't. No, because no, because there's nothing. It's all skin, right? <laughs> well, there's that, and but also, and they're aware of that. So they really got. And then the guy, you can hear them singing when the lights go down, and the song starts, mm. and so then the show stopped, and then it didn't resume. So people didn't see the final number. Mm. This happened also with a musical in Glasgow, and about a large part of, as I said, about 50 percent of theater staff throughout the country are thinking of resigning because they just cannot cope with the angst they receive well, from audiences. I make more money at McDonald's. Uh, but yeah. yeah, what do you think? Is this? Or is a junior uh, I mean, is this a trend? People are saying it's like after COVID and things have reopened and people have sort of lost their civility yeah, and don't I mean, know how to behave in public. Yeah. I really hope so. I mean, I can't believe something worth watching happened in a theatre. Well, it was Manchester. Yeah, it yeah. Was Manchester. As soon as I read Manchester, I was like, this didn't happen in the West End. I was like, oh, Manchester. Oh yeah, yeah. When I did uh, Manchester Comedy Store, I remember there was a group that were heckling me because I was I was Scottish and they got yeah. all rowdy and started, you know, I was, I was you know putting them down and stuff. And then uh, so security bundled them out because they started getting really aggy. And then they didn't chuck. chuck them out. They just put them in the voice. I had to walk through the group of men to leave. I started a riot in Manchester. Oh, print do you ever do the print works? That's no. a problem. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's about 400 people, about 200 people, like, absolutely went berserk. And oh, the wow. security had to escort me out the back. They had, like, six security around me and had to sort of bundle me out through the back. Yeah, way. You still got it. You yeah, still yeah, got yeah. it. Smashed yeah. Smashed it, mate. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> time now for a few ads. Uh, this haircut doesn't pay for itself, but stick around for drag queen degrees and transphobic barbers. See you in two. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? Rooms, apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Day. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. 
I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Welcome back to Headliners and getting straight into The Observer. And Scott, shocking news that private schools means you're rich. I mean, a Tory. It's weird, right? Um, uh, uh, UCL did a research um, looking at about 6,970 British people born in the same week in 1970 uh, who had attended private education institutes. Editions. And um, apparently, these people tend to vote Tory. Yeah, it's a, it's a shock, isn't it? Yeah, so people who go to private school are more likely to vote Tory. That shows that if you have a good education and you're successful, See? you're more likely to vote Tory. See, it's that's the sensible what it means. thing to do. That's yeah, I mean, the I, only conclusion you can draw from this. The thing that, it, the, what it said though, that's interesting is that, there, but there's no real upsurge in Tory voting in this country, even though uh, um, uh, not a majority, but a large group of people attend these, these uh, schools and universities. Mm. It, what it means is that people under the age of 40 tend not to vote. Uh, in, in, in a big wave of conservatism, they tend to hold off until they're older. Mm. So well, you were a young well, Tory, weren't you? No, I was, no. I was quite left leaning. All right. I'm not, Still, I don't really think I've now changed. He's lived them now. I don't, right. I don't really think. I don't think I've really changed. I think anybody who's sort of slightly centre left in the '90s is now seen as an absolute yeah, Nazi. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I'm a Green Party member because I, I like to just rip up my ballot and flush it down the toilet. Well, That's what I like to conserve. The thing is, actually, there is a paragraph at the end which is a bit of a surprise, where mm. it basically says that sort of disproved everything that it talked about because it said only a fifth of people who are private school attendees vol voting solid conservative every year. Yeah, basically. yeah. So actually it is less than you would think it is, and, which and goes it, against what the story is. It's interesting yeah. to think that some people, that I've never switched, I'm still a Democrat, I have been since I was 18 to vote in the US, but some people do switch, go, they move in and out of various parties throughout the UK quite often. It sounded like by this study that there's quite uh, a, a lot of sort of, I don't know, people changing their minds mm. every two years or so when they vote. The other thing which is quite interesting is that they talked about the parent, the newspapers that your parents read being as yes, much of that an impact. Has, yes. so people who get the Telegraph. Be, yes. Yeah, I mean, my parents got the Beano. <laughs> <laughs> not been a big help. My father's me. not, he, he's illiterate, he's Italian, but, uh, he, but he spouts a lot of facts and figures, so I, I always relied on him for, for news. Stories. He watches Fox News now because he likes the babes. He should follow Nick Dixon on Twitter. Right. On to The Telegraph next. And Leo, if the last story is true, then have Labour just found a way to get more votes? Possibly. So uh, Labour uh, are, are going to do a... They're planning a tax grab on private schools and private schools could lose lots of their pupils if mm -hmm. Labour does impose VAT on private school fees. Uh, so almost 60% of parents said that they would certainly or probably withdraw their child from their current school if the VAT of 20% was added to, to school fees. And this is this is really unfair. I mean, bear in mind, these, these parents already pay for the state school system through their taxes, like everybody does. But, you know, particularly these people, because they tend to be a bit more well-off, so they pay a lot more tax. Then they're being asked, and, and they don't even use the state school system, so then they're being asked to pay... Uh, well, the, then they're paying again uh, for, the, for private schools, and then the government is going to take money from that money they're giving to the private schools. It's like, how many times can somebody pay tax on the same bit of money? It's, it's insane. And also, it's going to actually reduce the amount of tax that the government gets. The, the government is hoping uh, that it would raise £1.6 billion a year. You know, it sounds, you know, it sounds like a, a decent whack. However, private schools save the government £4 billion a year because, of course, those people that are in private, kids that are in private schools don't need to be educated by the state. So, if 60% of the parents pull their kids out, all of a sudden the state's going to have to pay a lot more uh, to educate them. As, as, as ever, it's, uh, it's a case of the government getting involved in ruining something that worked quite well. Well, it did work quite well, but then there are other arguments to it. And I mean, what do you think, Scott? I mean, is it, 
it's not being from America. Do you, it seems like quite an obsession in this country, the whole public school, private school thing. I know a way to, sell, to save $12.9 million, I mean, and that's if we dip Prince Andrew's feet in cement and drop him in, <laughs> in the Thames. That's twelve point nine right there. And you don't have to tax people for the schools. There you go. Done. Finished. I'm pretty sure Labour would find a way to tax that. <laughs> the other thing, the that, there is something a bit more interesting in this article that also suggests that actually it's not just rich people who send their kids yeah, yeah. To, to private schools. In the, it seems like it's a lot of sort of the middle class, maybe upper middle yeah. class, yeah, yeah, yeah. who are actually making a lot of sacrifices to send their kids. And those are the ones who are going to be... Nailed like, even more so. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Pe people who really believe in sort of bettering themselves and working hard. And, you know, Labour, of course, uh, believe in just scrounging and stealing from, from other people. And uh, that's the taxation is theft, essentially. So the, the less taxation, the better. And it, Labour always peddled the, the sort of politics of jealousy. You know, I'm not meant to come in and say something about it. But you agree with me. No, you know, well, well no, I, I will. I mean, you know, my husband and I clearly, we don't have children, not for lack of trying, but we don't. <laughs> but we know that by paying this council tax that you pay, it's gone up this year. Um, even though it's just two gay men working as hard as we can. <laughs> uh, we're funding the schools and stuff for, for the little, uh, you know, the, the scum in the building behind us go to school. So we know that we're doing that as much as the little girls doesn't go to school, we're paying for education. And we don't resent it, but if they did this, I would resent it. Yep. That I would resent. Yep. Fair enough. Sticking with The Telegraph and Scott, this is less a uh, Mickey Mouse degree uh, more a sort of Mickey dressed as mini degree. <laughs> uh, which I'd like to see, actually. Uh, apparently, there's a um, arts school in this country called the Rose Bruford College, which uh, brags about Gary Oldman and Tom Baker going to this drama school. And they're going to add a course that is a, a remote taught course, which is so weird to me, of queer performance that teaches students how to be a drag queen. And uh, it's been branded by, as a Mickey Mouse degree by critics. Apparently, it's a 15-month course, that, again, that's taught remotely, apart from four short residencies. It costs 11 grand to take the course. And when you're done, you're a good old drag queen. And that is, <laughs> a lot of people have criticized it within the educational system and within social media saying, you know, I think those people on RuPaul's Drag Race, mm. some of whom have apparently inspired this, um, uh, this whole thing to start, because the people running this course are saying, look, you can make cash if you get this degree, because then you might be on RuPaul's Drag race. But you can make cash, right? I mean, there the drag. There's money drag in drag. I know make a lot of money. They do all right. It's true. Well, and gay bars pay a lot to drag acts, not not comedians, because the gay men in the audience think they're funnier than you. But they do like to see a, a guy in a dress. And bars, the, so much disposable income, they'll throw it your way. I know a lot of drag queens that do pretty well, but I don't think that's a reason to really take a course in it. I think you, you know there's a way to learn if you're a guy to wear a dress and be funny. I don't think you have to pay 11 grand in a university course. Well, is it like doing one of those comedy courses? It's not yeah. actually going to do... Well, yeah, because uh, there, yeah, yeah. there are university courses to do stand-up comedy now, and it's yeah. not something you can really learn from a course, especially when it's delivered over, over Zoom, as I think. This one, this one's a remote yeah. course. So you're not even... You're going to be just dressing up in a, in a frock in your, like, bedroom. Yeah, and, uh, I actually teach a comedy course that I do pretty well with. Thanks for that. But also, <laughs> I think... Um, no, but in a way... And I, and I thought that, too. When I first came over to take a drama course at Birmingham University here, when I... You know, a, a lot of the girls had pointing glasses and, and were bloated. And I said, you, you <laughs> girls, if you want to be in showbiz, you've got to learn to play the game. And a lot of them raised their, their little uh, their, their little chubby hands and said, look, we, <laughs> some of us want to be in theatre and education, some of us want to teach, some of us want to write. We don't all want to perform. I said, well, it's fortunate because half of you. Anyway, so <laughs> what I'm saying is people that take comedy courses or they take drag queen courses, maybe they don't want to perform. Yeah. Maybe they want to write drag monologues. Well, I know, but there right? is a serious thing here where... You know, this taxpayers essentially mm. will be paying this yes, grant if it doesn't get paid back. Yeah. These are one which, of those courses that yeah, well, the, the, the stats on student loans, it was insane. 20 billion a year in student mm. loans, and only about one in five of them is expected to pay their loan back in full. Mm. Outstanding loans reached 182 billion yeah. at the end of March last year. So, yeah. Yeah, and right. David Kahn, the, the actor, he's a brilliant comedic actor. He's in day-to-day uh, uh, -day and uh, brass eye and stuff like that. He, he says, you know, if you're trained to do a particular style of work, uh, you're gonna gonna be out of work because uh, you know this this type of work goes ebbs and flows with the fashions. Yeah, yeah. So RuPaul's drag drag race is big now, uh, but you know in a couple of years time be, it might not be. Maybe Lee Kearns. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Lee Kearns. Lee That's why. What I would be your TV show? Lee Lee Kearns. <laughs> <laughs> I call you Lee Kearns. Right. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> a good friend of mine, Lee. Uh, hello. But that's why I took modern dance at university. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right fair Let's go with the Telegraph next and how Iran oppresses its people with a little trick from the UK. <laughs> As a Scott, right? 
No, this is Leo. All right, uh, so Iran is, inst is installing cameras in public to crack down on women refusing to wear headscarves. Mm. Uh, so uh, the protests in Iran aren't just sort of organised masses of people, uh, which is getting more and more dangerous now that the police are, are firing on the, on the crowds. Uh, they're also doing just day-to-day -day, um, sort of lived protest where you know women won't wear their, their headscarves. This is after Masa Amini was, was killed by Iran's Islamic morality police for, for not wearing, uh, you know, not having her hair mm. covered. Uh, so now, you know, in response, people are, uh, women are, are not covering their hair. And there seems to be a lot of support for this amongst the, you know, the, the, I think the, the um, regime and the police are sort of treading a, a fine line. They're trying to crack down on it. They don't want it to, to get out of control. But also, any time they do crack down on it, People really don't like it. A lot of people in Iran are completely sick, and even people who maybe, you know, supported the uh, are Muslim and supported mm -hmm. the, the the regime, they're now sick of the morality police mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're heavy handed. Did you see a weird thing, Scott, where two women were actually assaulted with mm. yogurt, yeah. and then they're the ones who got an arrest warrant? Yeah, it yeah. Sounds, it sounds like New Zealand. I know. Yeah. <laughs> a mother and daughter were in a cafe, and a guy walked up, threw yogurt in the face. Mm. I thought that sounded nice. I'd be like. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I wonder if they had to charge them for it as well. Yeah. Would you get <laughs> someone else to throw some sliced banana? <laughs> yeah, that'd so, be nice. but Scott, I mean, do you think that the genie can be put back in the bottle in terms of women finding freedom in Iran? At this point, I think that anyone, uh, again, young people, people that want a future, so many of these young people have, they may be educated, but they have nowhere to go, nowhere to work, they have no hopes, and, and, and they're being told now that this is your life, that you are just going to live this... Um, life led by a corrupt government who doesn't allow you to even travel or to choose your spouse or to make any decisions about your own life in any way. Yeah. I think that it's not just the headscarf, it's everything. These people are completely fed up. They see how miserable their parents are. And also they're on social media and they see how the a, a majority of the rest of Europe and, and, and Central and Eastern America live, you yeah. know, so it's... it's just... I mean, we saw the Catholic Church in Ireland being brought down just by sort of word of mouth and people's experience mm -hmm. and, you know, what they saw their mothers and their grandmothers go through. And I think yeah. the same thing but is happening. And it happened so quickly over there. Yeah, Cultural yeah. shift, I mean, arguably too much. Anyway, final breather before the mad rush at the end. Stick about for wimpy librarians, an actually good Princess Diana story. And if you've got an electric car, you better watch where you park it. See you then. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the program sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching.
I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Headliners and Leo, Sunday's Telegraph, and this makes me pretty happy that I can't read. <laughs> yeah, so British Library staff are going to get emotional support oh. to help them add trigger warnings to their archive <laughs> of books and things. So the oh. library pledged to become an anti-racist organisation. Oh. Anti-racist means anti-white, by the way, because according to these people, only white people can be racist, so they're... Is it not enough to be non-racist? <laughs> no, no, you've got, got to be, be <laughs> you've got to be... You've got to be going around with a big sword killing racism. Uh, you, you can't just not be racist. Uh, so the, to achieve this anti-racist status, mm. uh, they've launched an action plan for race equality that means going through it, all their back catalogue, scouring it for anything that could be deemed problematic. And uh, uh, what, what else did I know? So right. Chief Librarian Liz Jolly... Uh, yeah, <laughs> I love this quote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She said that Jeez. racism was a creation of white people. Um, I mean, I, We're number one! Yeah, we... Like, <laughs> <laughs> the human race began in Africa, so I should imagine the first uh. person who looked at us, somebody who's slightly different to them and mm. said, oh, I, I don't like you, I don't want you coming into my village or whatever, mm. it wasn't white. The people who say that this sort of ridiculous statement, racism was a creation of white people, are the kind of people who have no ethnic minority friends. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, yeah. that's yeah. what it points and out. And she's probably me. never travelled. It's really amazing to me that someone in a position of power like that, how she ever got that... That job of authority, I have, I, I, yeah. I have absolutely no idea how she could say that to people. Well, how, she, how is she connecting it to George Floyd? She says the murder of George Floyd yeah. has shown that we're good at saying we don't believe racism, but I have to say the chief library. How is a British library connected <laughs> absolutely to insane. the murder in America? I mean, in a way, George social Floyd. media has done this, hasn't it? It's made every crime seem like it's in your own backyard. It's made everything that happens seem immediate and, mm. and it affects us all directly. And actually, this it doesn't affect you directly. I mean, it affects you in the way that any horrible crime affects people mm, okay. in the world. Yeah. But this is absurd. I mean, what they're going to probably do is they're going to do things like they're going to edit Huckleberry Finn and stuff. Yeah. And they've got mandatory training. Anyway, thoughts and prayers to anyone who works at the British Library. Daily Star next, and Scott, which one's worse, smacking or racism? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> apparently uh, Harry was in a car on a tour of London with his mom. When a she bus, was, I think it was, yeah. Yeah, with, with Diana when she was still... You know, doing her thing, and uh, he he did an he did an impression of somebody, and she said, "Don't do that," and she hit him. And Punjabi she, bus driver, that might help. And, yeah, sorry. You know, if you could do your Punjabi accent, I'd love to. Um, I think it, yours is better, John. Yours I is really much know. better. Let's all three do it at the same time. <laughs> <Yeah>. See <laughs> One, wins. two, go. Cool. Uh, oh. um, <laughs> um, Free uh, speech. Yeah. <laughs> Did, yeah, here's the, here's my impression of a bus driver. Does this bus stop at um, at Royal Oak? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> they always say that. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. But it's your bus on your route. I don't know where it stops. <laughs> but she, right. he, he asked her, she asked him to stop, and he didn't. He, and he afterwards, wouldn't. she gave him a little smack. She whacked him. And made yeah. him write a letter, but write the letter to the person who organised the tour, not to the actual no, bus and, driver. And, and, well, yeah, because the bus didn't have an address. It moves all the time. Yeah. That's how it works. And the guy leading the tour, he, was, he is said to have been relaxed about the casual racism. The conductor, a jovial chap wearing a bright yellow turban, mm. uh, was relaxed about Harry's casual racism. But Diana was so mortified. It was the 80s. Yes, that she had been on the trip. Different when, time. I, when I heard that she gave Harry a little smack, I thought that might have been the in introduction to his drug experiment. Yeah, maybe. But, yeah, I mean, he, he, he got revenge uh, in Afghanistan. I think that violence that she unleashed upon him, <laughs> uh, coupled with his uh, latent racism, then caused him to kill well, she 25, obviously didn't, the 25, smacking didn't Afghan, work, mm. 25 <laughs> Afghan men in yeah. Afghanistan. And he doubled down. He was like, I'm going to dress as a Nazi. You know, he yeah. does. I know Harry speaks French, mm. and I wonder if he's able to drive a motorcycle. Maybe he took his, his revenge out that way. You know, a few years later. OK, I should say, for Ofcom reasons, he didn't. Uh, <laughs> it's the Telegraph now. And, Leo, isn't this good news that we don't have to worry about China? 
just aliens. Well, this is amazing. Well, they, they could be Chinese. We, we don't know. Uh, but a former US fighter pilot has said that they were seeing UFOs daily. Uh, so the, the, the pilots trained in a sealed off block of airspace off the coast of Virginia where nothing else was allowed to fly. So, mm. you know, you're yeah. not going to see any weather balloons or, or commercial jets going through there. But they still, every day, they saw, uh, they saw these uh, objects, strange objects. They'd show up on radar. They thought it was just malfunctions in the radar. And then they'd confirm them visually. And these are, these are fighters pilots, they're trained, yeah. they've got perfect eyesight, they know what they're doing, and they, they saw, uh, they, they almost hit one of the things, it was described as a dark grey or black cube inside yeah. of a sphere. Well, you know what, sounds like we've got the plot for Top Gun 3. Uh, <laughs> last story of the show, and in The Independent, and Leo, this is actually very sad, we've lost one of our own. Yeah, so Gareth Richards, who's a, a great comedian who worked with uh, Frank Skinner uh, on, his, on his Absolute Radio show, uh, he has unfortunately died, uh, aged only 41, after a terrible car accident. And everybody, I mean, everybody in the comedy industry that's worked with him, you know, has nice things to say about him. And it, it just shows, I mean, comedy involves so much travel by car. You're always, you know, driving to, to shows. Yeah. I guess it's, uh, I mean, it's one of the hazards that comedians are up against. Could, I mean, it could be any of us, Scott, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, this is why I don't drive in the UK. I'm just... Mm. I'm a, I'm a terrible driver, but also because, yeah, I'm just, you come home late night from a gig and, well, you know. He was lovely, he was very funny, and yeah. very sad, and Dolphins, um, right? thoughts and prayers to his wife. I know those empty words, but I mean it. Anyway, the show's nearly over now, so let's take another quick look at Sunday's front pages. The Mail on Sunday, Charles at odds with Church over his diverse coronation. The Sunday Telegraph, Tories at war over pact with Labour in Scotland. Observer, hospitals in frantic bid to fill gaps left by Dr. Strike. The Sunday Express, King to rescue Rishi and it'll boost the economy too. Sunday Mirror, I'll fight guns and gangs for my live. And finally, the star, love split ghost, hubby's talking me. I'm really sad that we missed that story. That's all we have time for. Thank you very much to my guests, Leo Kurse and Scott Capiri. Thanks, guys. Um, tune in the same time tomorrow, of course, where Nick Dixon will be joined by Cresta Wetton and Francis Foster. And remember, if you're watching the 5 a.m. repeat, stay tuned for The Breakfast Show just after the break. Good morning, good evening, thank you. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubry, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Co. Right, you're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. my political ambitions are, <laughs> those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubry, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The people 